How's it going, everyone? Good afternoon. Thank you for attending today's webinar. Uh, we'll be starting in a few in a few seconds. Also, if you have any questions, uh, by all means, we strongly encourage you to participate because this and um webinar is is um in, 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 you know it's pretty much interactive. So any questions, concerns, um, you know, Martha will be able to address those questions, those comments, as I will be your moderator. Um, in addition, in the chat, by all means, uh, introduce yourselves. Are you in business? What type of business um, are you in? How long have you been in business? Um, so like that will be more tailored towards the conversation for today's uh, webinar. Some challenges that you might be experiencing as well. Martha will be able to assist you in, um, in today's presentation as well. And then if you have any questions, you could definitely put them in the Q&A. And then uh, throughout the webinar, I'll be able to, to moderate them for you as well. In addition, uh, this webinar is being recorded. So in case you have to step out um, or answer a phone call, uh, we'll be able to email you the link that is uploaded through our YouTube channel. And also the presentation as well will be emailed to you as well. All right. So um, thank you once again for attending today's webinar. My name is Jesus Padilla. I am the manager of administrative services here at the Florida SBDC at FIU. And it's a great pleasure to have um, Martha Roy. She's our government contracting consultant here at the Florida SBDC at FIU. Next slide. And I'll give you a brief description of what is the SBA Community Navigator Pilot Program. It was established by the American uh, Rescue Plan Act of 2021. Uh, that uses a community navigator approach to help the small businesses with the econ economic recovery. It is compromised as a lead hub, in this case is the Florida SBDC at FIU, as a center of network of spoke organizations that employ community advocates to work with small businesses on the recovery and the resiliency, in which uh, 51 grantees were awarded uh, for a total of $100 million and was broken up in three different tiers, the national, state, regional, and local, in this case, the Florida SPDC at FIU um, received the state and regional uh, tier. Next slide. What is the goal? Is to improve the long-term economic recovery and the resiliency among small businesses, you, the small business owners. The overall core uh, program activities include the technical assistance, training and outreach, and sharing information and resources. So it is a, a um, no cost, confidential business consulting to assist you and to address those small business needs that you are seeking. In which, um, once again, it's a two-year program that we received a $2.5 million grant um, to create this navigating uh, navigator network for the Miami-Dade County small businesses. Once again, the overall goal is to create that local navigator um, network to assist the socially and economically disadvantaged businesses with the training, mentoring, and trainings as well. Next slide. In which, besides the Florida SBDC at FIU, we also have excellent uh, partners as well as the spokes. We have Ascendis, Branches, the EDC of South Miami-Dade, the Miami-Dade Chamber of Commerce, Los Preda, and the SARP FIU procurement. My colleague, Laura, um, and I will be able to assist you. So in case if you're looking for introductions to these uh, fine um, organizations, we'll be able to assist you to do that bridge and that connection um, with them and as well as assist you any way we can um, to address some business inquiries, challenges that you're, that you're seeking. We're family, we're here more than happy to assist you to address them. In addition, I wanna uh, thank you all for attending. And I know that y'all came here to see uh, Martha, learn more about Martha's experience and also today's webinar. So without further ado, allow me to introduce you to Martha Roy. Yes, thank you, Jesus. Um, as always, I welcome sharing um, my knowledge with the community. Thank you everybody for joining us today. So this webinar is gonna cover general um, government contracting and conditioning. And one disclaimer is, I'm not aware of a magic formula, um, for, you know, government contracting, it takes, you know, patience, learning, um, and just being able to maneuver the government um, arena. So pretty much this webinar will offer us an overview of the steps required. So basically, the government we know is the largest buyer in the U.S. Um, saying that also 
the government, yeah, we say the government buys everything, but there are certain commodities, products that the government tends to buy more. So as you're studying your business and getting into your laws and regulations, what, when I teach you guys what a method of procurement means, what are social economic interests um, in different phases of how the government acquires the goods and services and the different types of contracts. And getting registered is the key. Because if you're not registered, and registered has nothing to do with certification. Basically, registration means that you are, you are registering at entities that you have an interest to do business with or you have an interest to be recognized by. Because without being registered, you don't exist. They don't know. And that starts with vendor registration, profile, depending on what type of entity you're trying to court at the time. So our laws and regulations, so you know there's the our public laws. Fed, um, in 1994, the federal government, believe it or not, streamlined um, the laws and regulations around acquisition, um, around procurement and acquisition, because if you take things or overwhelming and a lot now, things were even more prior to um, the mid-90s. Um, so you also have your military and your civilian um, codes. So these, because there are military entities that acquires goods and services, and so are civilian entities. Then, um, so the, the streamline ended up with the federal um, acquisition regulations, which is still like Bibles of regulations. But the good thing is they have um, broken down the FARS, which is um, what you know is referred to in the government world. And if you, um, if any of you, whether you're um, startups or advanced, if you're reading an RFP, an RFQ, or anything on the government website, they usually refer to four four clauses. These are so the FAR regulations. Are, so let's say 52.104.3, for example, will drive. So this regulation is driving the part of the work of the contract that you're being um, awarded to, or you have to um, you know, manage and deliver. That's so why I said, there's no way everybody's gonna be fluent in the FARS, but when you're reading an RFP and you're interested in that job, and there's the contract, um, model that's usually part of that RFP because all the rules and regulations of the RFP usually gets flowed down to your awarded contract. At least get familiar with what part of these funds are driving the paperwork that you're signing. And as I said, um, breaking down the funds was really um, something else they did because now you know you have your defense department. So um, the, we call them the DFARS for um, EPA, which is um, the environmental folks. They had their own portion of the FARS, so they kind of broke it down, even down to civilian agency supplements. They broke it down where if you have certain contracts that only certain FAR regulations are referred in that, these are the only ones that you gotta get yourself familiar with. So I know everybody um, knows this in today's voting day um, on top of it. So you have your three branches of government and you know, so we're not gonna go into this, that was part of the slide. So these are the governing bodies, even part of the acquisition process. So that's what this um, slide is here. So your federal agencies, there's like around 125 military and civilian, like the previous slide showed, where there's certain four regulations that drives the civil, uh, the military, and then you have your civilian. And I'm pretty sure everybody here has, have heard of um, SAM.gov, which is um, whether, you know, and I tell folks, once you register on Sundays, since we happen to be in Florida, the first thing is registration Sundays. The second thing is getting your um, federal identification number with the IRS, and um, really the third thing is to get your local business tax receipt, um, whichever municipality 
that you happen to be in, meaning Miami, Dade, Broward, or um, West Palm County, and that has nothing to do with sales. The local business tax receipt is basically if the same way you have your son business registration, where the state of Florida is giving you permission to um, have this business, your local business tax receipt from your municipality is giving you permission for that business to be in this municipality. Because a lot of the registration as vendors or filling out profiles, even with your Fortune 500 companies, some they would require the local business tax receipt. So that's another big document I think that's important to have. Um, and so, and you also have your, any requirements over 25,000. So um, there's some slides in here that would show you the level, the different levels of how the government acquires the good. So what we call small purchases or, um, you know, per, they're usually anything under a certain threshold, the requirements are different. So I guess that's the way, yeah, I would put it. So um, usually anything under $25,000, I don't know if anyone knows the difference between an RFQ and an RFP. An RFQ is basically a request for quote, meaning that the price is what the determination is. So um, usually any kind of procurement under $25,000, you'll have a little um, caveat depending on the agency that you're dealing with. Some of them would have these um, small purchases for only certified veterans. If it's the VA we're talking about, for example. So if it's um, another agency, they would probably, uh, no, not probably, they most likely would have the small purchases for the um, social economic groups that we're gonna cover um, doing this thing. So when you're registered and certified, you're put in certain groups that you can apply for these um, little opportunities versus if you're just a business there, you're not, uh, first of all, if you're not registered, they can pay you, they don't know you exist. So you can be a, um, you can be a supplier unless you, you know, a vendor and a supplier is the synonym of um, vendor, right? So you can supply goods and services until you're recognizing the system pretty much. So anything usually over this amount, competition is required. So that's when you go into your RFPs, which is your request for proposal, which is a more lengthy process that requires um, a lot more information and where the price sometimes is not the deciding factor. And so there are the three phases of the acquisition process. So you have your pre-award. Pre-award is usually, um, pre-award is when all the bids have been received. So um, I've been in capacities um, with the government where I've received all the bids and then my group would do the bid analysis, you know, checking the, um, everybody is bidding apples to apples and orange to oranges, making sure that whoever, um, you know, responded to, the bid has been responsive and responsible, meaning that you're in compliance with the proposal that was put out, that your, you know, your cost, everything is in order. So pre-award being you have been identified, because usually it's the top three proposals that get um, recommendation for award. So the same group that has done the analysis would give an award recommendation to the higher ups that has the signature authority. So that's your pre-award. Why is this important? Because when you get to the award stage, when your pre-award, you get um, in touch with your first awardee, the top person. And a lot of times, believe it or not, that person may not have one um, an element, whatever that is, because I've had um, situations in my past where either the person that can, you know, resources will be hard not to have because you have to demonstrate that to even be a responsive or responsible. So let's say, um, for example, um, something big happened, the person's um, key personnel, because that would be a big thing, um, 
on the project. God forbid something happens to them and they have to be of the project. And that contractor did not have an equal or better replacement for that key personnel. So that can fall the, you know, the award of the contract. So if they give you like, look, you got like three days to send us an equal or better, boom. Now you go to the second person that was on your list. So when you finally get a responsive and responsible bidder, you do your award. Award is you invite your contractor in with the contracting personnel from the government or the entity that's acquiring the goods or services, and you sign the contract. Everybody agrees. And oh, very important, prior to um, you know the award and signing of the contract, you get a chance to review your document before you sign. And it is important. That's when, you know, if you're at the stage of going for an RFP versus RFQs or versus maybe subcontracting opportunity, if you feel big enough that you can do a work on your own, please invest the money and have somebody with a low back the, um, background at least review your terms and conditions. Because um, I always tell people, contracting officers are humans too. For example, if something wrong, a, a, a wrong clause or something that is should not be your responsibility for the contract or the wrong price is stated and, you know, your job before you sign and, you know, they give you a time frame to review the contract and come back for signature and you didn't catch that, you know that you um, did, you know, $75 for this um, line item for this personnel, it got reversed to 57, and you don't say anything. But when you sign on that dotted line, guess what? You're bounded by that contract. So it's super important. I said three, four, five sets of eyes, whoever many sets of eyes, please review the document before you sign. So your post award now, it depending on the type, again, of commodities that was awarded. In construction, for example, as the um where the people have to stage and come and mobilize they call it the mobil mobilization process so they come in and set up you know they have to set up health offices whatever it is boom 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 when do the deliverable start so your post award is when you're you starting to um you starting to deliver the goods that has been acquired by the government. As we talked about the methods of procurement, you have your micro purchases. I, I usually encourage um, especially startups. And when I say startups, that's when you already have your local business tax receipt. You have, you know, um, you're registered on well, in your rightly state of Florida, your um, state of Florida vendor. Your, um, if you're in Broward, Miami, or West Palm, you are a vendor for your county where they are monitoring your business and can assess you whatever taxes, depending on the good and um, services you're doing, and um, and hoping that you get you have certification. Even though micro purchases and single quote um, certification are not required, but um, a big percentage of these are usually set aside for these special groups because you know that they're small enough and, you know, so that's part of what the government is building um, to try to get companies to go from one stage to the next. And then you have your simplified acquisition. Again, simplified acquisition, basically the IFQ process is such a voluptuous process depending on what is being acquired. So you can have things that are, you know, um, just with terms and conditions um, uh, with a purchase order, for example. But as long as you're going to abide and agree to the terms and conditions, so that's part of the, you know, it doesn't have to be a full-blown contract. Like, um, you know, you would have a contract over 250000 Then you have your seal bid. Still between all you're gonna do is drop um the price, you know, for the government um in a seal price um thing. Usually they don't do it, they don't open it publicly when they um mention price on me. Again, when you get your RFP, 
The IFP explains every single step. Because one thing with the government, um, the mentor is to be transparent and, um, you know, as transparent as possible. And, you know, making that's why things have to be available because these are taxpayer dollars. These are public funds that we're talking about. Then you have your invitation to bid. What does that mean? Meaning that you could have a specialty um, that the government needs. So instead of putting out um, RFP, a request for proposal, they would invite a certain, you know, group to bid for this particular commodity. Um, invitation to negotiate, um, again, um, you can come in and they can negotiate a prize. And um, sometimes that happens with R&D projects, research and development. Sometimes um, when, the, when the commodity cannot be defined, when the service cannot be like an exact service, so there's different methods that the government can use um, to ensure that they are covered. Um, request for quote, like we talk about, you know, RFQ, where price is the only thing they look for. Because and you, usually RFQs are used for um, items, you know, um, office supplies and things that they don't have to, um, you know, they'll give you the specs as long as you can meet those specs. But these are not um, commodities that they need, you know, um, to ensure that there's a process for it, there's a delivery method and, and, and so on. And these are RFQs also usually quick turnaround um, requests, requests for qualification. Again, this is not a contract. The government is out there looking to see if there's somebody qualified or many firms are qualified to do the scope of work, you know, and that's usually new things that is not already on the market or maybe something that a little more advanced than what um, is already existing. And here are, are requests for proposal. Believe it or not, in the request for proposal, the qualification is your biggest um, factor. Why? Because in most requests for proposals, they give it, they're gonna give you an evaluation factor um, Factor meaning how they're gonna what each section of this RFP, um, the weighted for that so equal a hundred points because it's not you know the most point so the most qualified. I have had to um, award contracts based on most qualification over price or cost data because if um, you know he shows comes and gives me a um, response to an RFP where it's about, you know, 200,000 less. Um, but these qualifications are not bad now, you know? Um, and then another person that's premier based on, you know, so Laura comes in and really show me in details, you know, I identifying my problem because that's usually how your RFP should be, um, you know, once you do a little um, executive summary, which usually weighs something too, executive summary is, um, you know, not where were you born or how you studied your business or the passion for your business. It's a synopsis of your, you know, introduction. This is who I am, you're established here, and boom, 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 right? Um, and so, how qualified are you? Meaning that, you know, and this is the problem that's been identified. These are my methods of solving this problem. This is a timeline for me solving this problem. And this is what it would take to, you know, and oh, and this is the end result. So these are, you know, so once you're able to qualify, I can promise you that you could be a higher price because as a contracting officer, you can write a justification, you know, as to why you feel that even though the price may be slightly higher, you know, by a, um, and, and even a couple of um, 200,000 or 250, 300, whatever. But if you can, you know, prove that 
you feel that this company not only have they proving the qualifications, but they're proving past performance. And they have some great references. And you're talking about federal government references, which, which I don't know if I have a slide on, but I'll touch on. You know, for every contract that you do, whether it's private or government, make sure you get that reference from them saying that, oh, great, you answered, um, you know, to the call. And that's going to be um, very helpful when you're putting RFPs in the future. So, um, but, you know, that shows your past performance. That's what this, this is, um, also, you know, mapping past performance. So source is sought. A lot of people receive this and have no idea what this is. And I remember even being in the government trying to explain to them, look, I think there should be a better way to send this out. But 30, 40 years later, I'm still receiving sources. So what does this mean? This means the government, um, one of the um, agencies has received a scope of work from the technical group. Now, because really, our job as government officials is to always look for sources in the small business registered certified world to be able to meet the 5% dedicated only to women businesses of the trillion dollar budget for procurement and acquisition. Because when a government agency don't meet that goal, you know, so that's, that's not a good thing. And if you exceed the goal, I mean, they always look to meet it and when they can exceed it. So it's in their interest to go out there and seek sources that can say, yes, I can do this. And oh, I'm sorry. And, and usually, uh, you know, it tells you exactly. It's usually a questionnaire that you have to answer. Please answer them if you guys get them and you would only get them again if you're registered with the right primary commodity code, the right service codes. So when they put those codes in the computer and they're looking for uh, SBEs, for example, small business enterprises, DBEs, disadvantaged business enterprises, ZEP certified, and they put that in there and then the companies come up, they send out this mass email. And, um, you know, from when I was in the government, we were lucky if we got back, you know, um, I don't know, 5%. Now I'm hearing it's even less. So when we are there saying that we're not finding opportunities for the government, if the government don't know that we exist, if the government don't know that we have this expertise that they may be looking for, they don't know to look for you. So request for information is a little bit, um, you know, lesser than the sources sought. Request for information is usually they have um, kind of identified who the sources are that they may want to request more information on, or it may be just um, a general app request for information um, for, for what they need um, to do. So level of procurement. And um, the tables that I was lucky to find for this um, presentation uh, have been updated January this year. So the government, um, the methods or is what I talked about earlier, with the different types of um, you know small purchases versus right so under the uniform of course we have to comply with what the requirements are basically this is what's telling us because um, they're using federal funds for goods and services so or micro purchases like there are usually no quotes are required because. The, you know, and I've been trying to, they don't advertise them. I've been trying to really find that, which I haven't really um, dedicated more time um, to. But I know that the school board here, Miami-Dade County School Board, and even the county itself have some micro purchases. Jackson may have some, but my understanding is also a lot of the um, city municipalities, so it's like your city of Miami, Doral, all your incorporated um, 
places, again, whether your business is there or not, if you're not registered, they don't know that you exist. Um, so they tend to do their purchases this way for quick stuff. For example, um, I think today is um, the 23rd of um, August. The fiscal year ends September 30th. So whatever money that cannot be transferred to next year, because there are certain funds, when the government delegated to that um, to that federal agency, if it, it could be five-year funds, it could be a two-year funds, because it's not really money as we know it. These are like um, warrant, they call it. So they warrant the contracting officer up to this to spend the year, you know, with her um, procurement group. So they, that's the time they use this method because whatever money they cannot transfer, they lose. Is use it or lose it. So that's why back in the days, I remember um, during that time of year, because of the 8 a certification, um, so what they would do, they would clump a lot of these purchases or contracts into um, socioeconomic groups that they know, you know, can turn the work around or what have you. So when I had eight, eight clients, I used to literally call myself spending the night at the SBA office because that's when you get your contract extensions. Because guess what? You could also have funds in your contract. If your contract can be extended and you've been a good um, person in your contract, and this is recurring services, they will extend the time and allow you to spend that money. But the criteria is it has to be signed by the contracting officer, even if it's on the 30th of September. It has to be prior to, um, to October 1st, um, September, um, yeah. So because the funds expire, so that, that's when they tend to, you know, the services that they would get, you know, um, from, from the thing. So the requirement is, of course, your prices have to be reasonable because of what I just said, that these people have to spend their money doesn't mean that, um, you know, you're going to try to sell, sell them a pair of scissors for $100, you know, type thing. So they still got to be accountable for what's being spent. Um, spent. It, so still on the method of procurement. So this is a simple, what we call simple and informal acquisition. So that's usually, um, you know, restricted to 10,000 for the federal threshold of under 22,000. So they can use this method of procurement, you know, with that. Um, so, and I know this probably sounds like a lot, but as um, government contracting officials, there are so many rules and regulations and lane to follow in how you can acquire services depending, you know, if it's not an emergency and, and all of this. So that's why these things are so important that, you know, um, the way that it works. So if you go on under your simplified and informal, so under 22,000. So um, same here. So must use restrictive federal that um, exemption for services. So restrictive dollars, as I said, if your money is going to expire, so, you know, it would be a restrictive fund for you to be able to um, transfer it to, um, you know, purchases. So from reasonable number of qualified sources here, you can go out and get, you know, more than one, two or three um, quotes. Because they, they like to see at least three. Really, the walls is more than one. So um, when you get two quotes, it's kind of hard sometimes, you know, to um, make justification. So when they say at least three, we like to get three or four, like that. If the, you know, if two of them are really like unreasonable and junky, you got two to four back on. And so now we go into a seal bidding. Anything seal become your formal advertising. So formal advertising meaning that they have to advertise it by law. When I was doing it, it was 30 days. And so um, usually, you know, um, it would take anywhere from six months to nine months when you go backwards from advertisement to award of a contract, again, depending on the complexity of the commodity 
um, meaning, you know, the services um, or supplies that you're buying. So here, bids are usually publicly solicited so they can have different types of contract. Term fixed price awarded, meaning that um, if you bid $200,000 um, $200, for this job, and then um, all you and you meant to really bid um, maybe six hundred thousand, and somebody made a typo, and you didn't catch it. Even though when we get it, we're like, wow, these people are really underbidded, which is part of what a lot of contractors do. And we tell them, please, that's the worst thing you can do because you don't want to default on a contract. And if you know, so. 200,000, whatever that you get, you sign your firm fixed price contract for, whether it's gonna cost you 600,000 to 1.2 million, all you're getting from the government is what you sign that firm fixed price contract for. So that's why firm fixed price means make sure that all your cost is into that bid. Every single thing, and people sometimes don't even know, your insurance, the cost of doing business, that's what it's called your, you know, overhead. And, you know, so that's a whole different class. But, you know, your loaded your loaded rate, um, the benefits to your employees, all that has to be the cost of doing business. Make sure that, you know, when it's a firm fixed price contract, it encompass everything. Because when it tells you firm fixed price contract awarded to the responsible bidder, lowest in price, or in, when they do the price analysis. So that would be anything in excess of 250,000. So um, non-competitive proposal. And also, I'm sorry, um, over here to um, the seal bid, the, your IFPs, request for proposal will fall um, over there. So um, non-competitive. Non-competitive meaning that's where the government has the right to have set aside, meaning that they can take a portion of the budget and decide that I'm only gonna give this part of money to women certified owned businesses. I'm only gonna reserve this part of money for economically um, disadvantaged women owned businesses, which is another um, certification that women can get. The VA, and the VA is known for this, that part of money is reserved for veterans. Now, disabled veteran gets a lot more um, you know, play, but veteran status, you know, and I call it like veteran status, women, you know, um, minorities, you know, small businesses, and so on and so on. So your your goal as a small business, especially if you want to play in the government arena, is to try, um, you know, not stomp, stomping your growth, but studying really small, because with the government, especially the federal level, um, you got to be able to demonstrate that you're confident, you've done this before, this is, you know, what I can do. And because we are not going to be, um, you know, I don't want to use the word guinea pig. I'm sorry, but I can think of any other word. But, you know, because um, I'm amazed sometimes people that just incorporated Maybe even from as um, young as 2018, they have the AA certification in mind. Yeah, you could already have your state, you have your local, you have your, um, you know, now you want to work on the federal, you can still have your SAM profile. And depending on your social economic um, group, you can be certified at the federal level. But it, it should be people that have been in business five, yeah, and I, I recommend eight years, you know, easily eight years because the AA is a short-term program. Yeah, I have seen people get super comfortable with it. I have seen more people lose at everything they've had. You know, even the GSA schedule, you know, people want to jump on the GSA schedule. You know, understand what this schedule means. There is a training that is required for folks to do, no matter, you come to me, yeah, we're gonna have to go back to step one, especially if you have not done the due diligence, which I cannot do for you. 
I can, you know, um, go through it with what I've done with clients where we share the screen and I work them through the website because I don't want you to be intimidated. But, you know, some of that resources that we give to you, you have to be, you know, due diligent. Because I always tell my clients, when that contracting person now calls, they're not going to call to ask for Miss Roy. They're going to call to ask for, um, you know, Miss Rhoda. And you have to be able... They're not going to take things out of your head. If they ask you a question, you have to be able to verbalize your business and explain any attachment that you put into a package, anything that you're trying to go after. If there's some kind of um, misunderstanding or it's not clear and you can explain it to them already, that tells me you're not ready. If, if you don't know your own project, I'm not going to know it for you. So it's important to be able to express the right verbiage to be able to, you know, um, connect when somebody asks you A, B, don't answer C, please, and then go back to A. We don't want to know this. I'm asking you specifically this. That's why, as you can see, most of government things, if you read it carefully and or patient, it's almost like um, multiple choice questions. You know two of them that are totally ridiculous and that one that's the most likely. So it's almost common sense um, to me. And I apologize because I've been doing this for so long. I can talk like that, but um, basically that's what it is. So, um, you know, they're letting you know when these um, non-competitive things, um, you know, for your sole source, when we talk about sole source, sole source meaning that, you know, um, the AP program has um, sole source more so than I've seen. Um, and again, that's after years of establishing relationship with folks, the vets, even women own, um, you know, source of meaning that I can be um, as a contracting body, that I'm going to identify Jesus's firm to, to do this contract for me. And trust me, source source is not done out of the hat. That's because he's, he has demonstrated that he's been able to do this task flawlessly on time. I always say on, um, on the budget. <laughs> which doesn't exist, but um, on the budget, meaning on budget for government. So on the budget and on schedule, right? So um, public emergency, when there's an emergency, that's why um, a lot of times they have things called pre-qualified polls, where the contracts are already written and the terms and agreements have already been signed upon, so they can just go down the list and call. Um, Miata, are you able to deliver this for me in the next 24 hours? Uh, you got an hour to get back to me. They call Jesus. And Jesus said, what? I got a stack in the warehouse. So it becomes, you know, number one. So that's your um, public emergency where they can just do this without competition. And, you know, after soliciting seven sources and they can find, you know, the competition is not adequate. So they can, if they find the right person, they can do it. So as you can see, these firms only fall for goods and services, um, for, I'm sorry, for goods and supplies. So under your services, it's only available for single source. Again, sole source is the same thing. Okay, they're about the same. So, um, so these, these terms can be used for goods slash supplies slash services. So your requirement is it only come from one source, as we just talked about. You don't have to get um, at least two, like the government, you know, um, likes to tell you. It use um use only when qualifying um, circumstances apply. And usually, you know, the contracting officer having to write the justification of why they had to go to that method of procurement. So and it's usually fixed price or fixed cost because there's no you know um time to negotiate this and that and then all reimbursement type. So usually if it's a time and material, meaning that, you know, they reimburse you, your material um, with your upload fee and um, whatever labor rates, whichever way the contract was, um, you know, con composed, and they pay for your labor and material. So that's what's like usually cost type reimbursement. So um, types of contract, we almost talked about that. So you have your cost plus your fixed fee, meaning that, you know, the cost that it takes you to literally do this work. Please don't think that, oh, my God, I looked at the last contract, which is, you know, we've been teaching 
um, throughout um, this class in FIU startup. But if you're interested in a project, it's always good to go and look at what the last awarded contract was. How did, you know, they won it? What was the price? How did they, um, you know, bid it and so on? So now, even a contract that's three years ago, you have to be mindful of the cost because three years ago, we didn't have the logistics problem that we have having now. So people that are doing fuel, people that are doing transportation. So you got to look at that in a different light. As long as you can justify the adjustment in cost, you know, why the cost would be so much higher based on current market value. And so your fix me meaning that a lot of times cost plus, this thing can go up. I hardly see it go down, but then again, if the government cut your contract for misbehavior, this cost can also go down. But um, going up meaning that the government can ask you to do additional work based on um, change orders. You can never do anything different than the contract dictates for unless the government gives you a change order. And even if um, you work in the field with somebody every day and you know that the government representative, look at your contract and see who the authorized person is. Because if um, he still signs it and he didn't have the authority where Laura was to sign it, guess what? You just did this extra work for free because we can't, you know, you didn't have the authority to do this work, but you moved on to do it. So um, this cost can go, but your fee stays the same. So this is cost plus award fee. So um, it's whatever fee that was awarded during the contract, pretty much. Oops. And incentive fee. So I wanted to share this. Incentive fee is usually, um, if you can show um, on the project, and set, you know, um, incentive, and that's where the cost sharing falls into, where you can do this scope um, at a less time, because less time already means less budget. So already, if you can bring the schedule up a whole month or two weeks, whatever, that saves time and money. So, you know, this incentive fee can, so you share the cost with the government. Now, I, um, it's been so long since I've done this in person. So, um, you know, oops, sorry. And so I believe this is pretty much incentive fee. So your cost sharing is you, um, when the government gives the contractor um, the leeway to whatever cost is um, saved, the government share it with the contractor. So cost sharing, we did a lot when I was at the um, nuclear site, I believe, where um, you put it where you give the contractor a higher percentage. And trust me, the incentives get crazy, the way that they get creative and save that money so they can get extra fee, which, be, you know, extra cost now, um, you know, to their fixed fee, right? So types of contract, we talk about term fixed price where this is what you have. It doesn't matter um, if you made a typo and you mis misplaced your numbers, what you sign is what you get. This one, economic adjustment, we just kind of covered it a little bit. Meaning that, let's say if, um, there was like this multi-year contracts. So let's say right prior um, 2020, somebody was awarded a five-year contract that goes into 2025. So we know that um, it's a firm fixed price contract or ever with the fuel, if, depending on what commodity that was affected by this, um, I don't know what we just had, inflation, um, whatever um, they're calling it. Um, so the government can allow you to adjust your price based on economic um, issues. So they're calling it, you know, based on the economy. So you can do the economic adjustment. So we talked about the incentive fee and the award fee. 
in the previous slide. Um, so you also have what you call your um, IDQ contracts. So um, indefinite um, delivery or indefinite quantity contracts, meaning that um, these are stock. So let's say that we know the school board uses pencils and uses um, dispensable items. So usually they use this type of contracts where they don't have to keep, you know, sending terms and condition. So they can, um, you know, send your delivery or whatever quantity via um, purchase order or work order or task order. There's different names for them. Again, the important for this is to make sure that whoever authority is authorized um, to give you that order is who sign that order. That's the only way you're going to get paid because that's the only contractual agreement that you have. So you have your blanket purchase agreement. Usually these are used um, also for um, disaster type um, thing or where the government, you know, have to identify maybe, um, oh, that's used in the pre-qualification polls where I've, I've identified contractors. And so there's a blanket purchase agreement, meaning that they've sat and negotiated Everybody agrees with the terms and conditions. There's also something in those big, big contracts called um, reps and shirts. That's the um, short version for representations and certifications. These are all the paperwork that comes with an RFP that you have to sign all those affidavits and um, swear and confirm, blah, blah, blah. So your bank and purchase agreement are also um, services acquired by um, purchase orders, um, you know, as they need. Time and material, we talked about that um, earlier, where, you know, some contracts are awarded on time and material, meaning that every labor hour that your staff spend on this particular project and any material associated with that project that was proposed as part of your RFP or billable under this contract. So that's usually, you know, um, labor rates, established labor rates, and, uh, you know, whatever material. If it's an IT contract, you know, you can have your IT specialist, your program manager. Um, these are, you know, it's usually based on labor categories. And labor hour is almost time and material, less the material. Now, I've worked in, um, when I switched from government to corporate, um, most of my corporate jobs, we were referred to as either seconded staff um, to government officials or, um, or I forgot what the other terms were, or shadowed staff, where we would shadow, basically, we did all the work and we didn't have signature authority. So um, when I talk about, you know, the um, analysis, the... Um, bid analysis, receiving the bids, putting um, bids out. So everything that I did on the government side, when I switched over to corporate, was what I was doing, um, you know, for, um, but at this point, us sending out um, stuff for, um, for subcontractors, because I work for the likes of the Bechtels and the AECOMs and um, these folks. So your letter, Letter is usually, um, you know, a sample. Oops. Where were we? Okay. Letter is usually, you know, um, sample acquisition, usually under 100, um, 10,000. So they could give you a letter um, to acquire a um, small quantity of goods. So your social and economic interests, all of these under the federal government are considered social economic interests, your large businesses, whether you're black, white, Asian, white, um, white, small businesses, Native American. The white falls because the federal government is um, race neutral. So you can get your 8A, um, or oh, I, I don't know if I should take that back, but I know there's, um, they can fall, you know, the white race falls on the socioeconomic. Oh, for example, women, um, they would fall under the women-owned small business 
under the SBA. When you go to better certify that job to um, register for that, however, women that look like me, Hispanic, um, Asian, Native Americans, we can go the extra mile for the economically um, disadvantaged women own where it's not open to the Caucasian. So that's the best example I can give. Um, so again, your service disabled veterans and your veterans all together. So I'm always ahead of myself because I've made this so long. And again here, um, as a veteran, why? Because it's a federal program. So Caucasian fall under this if you've been to the military at some point. Over here, economically disadvantaged, this is only for minority women. You have to show your minority status and you have to show your economically disadvantaged. And that, you know, well, the thresholds, most of us, when I'm working with my clients, I said, we're not there yet. It's not that, it's not a firm no. Where the women own small business, every woman fall under that. So the competition here is like this. I want, and then where you can get to groups that are like that. So these are the differences in socioeconomic um, programs. And then I don't know whoever saw my certification um, presentation yesterday. So that's where the present um, the certifications become critical for small business. So you can put yourself smaller and shine instead of trying to shine in the bigger bucket. So again, you know, um, because I talked about disabled veteran, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about those veterans. You don't have to just be disabled, but um, they have the disabled status. And um, as a disclaimer, up to probably last year, at least that's when I discovered it, um, I used to just be able to do the DD-214 and the um, honorable discharge letter for the veterans. But now the federal government has a database where you have to have um, a, a vet, um, oh my God, it's a veteran database where you kind of be vetted through that database and you get a paperwork and that's the one they recognize for every certification. And then you have your hub zone. Your hub zone is basically um, location, location of your business or location of 35% or more of your workers. What does this mean? Um, if you have, uh, and there's a um, website where you can look up if you're in a hub zone. Let's say if you're based in a hub zone and you're like a five person company, as long as 35% of that five, so you don't have to have, you know, 20, 30 um, number of employees. Even if there's, um, somebody told me, even if there's like two employees and the location of the business is in a hub zone and one employee, you, you can count it as a hub, you can go for the hub certification um, with the caveat that these two employees do most of the business at that location. So to make a di um, distinction from what I just said, Let's say you've got a job location that's in a hub zone. Even if you have eight employees there, you cannot count that as a hub zone unless the eight, uh, unless thirty-five percent of the eight employees that will be working there are uh, there live in a hub zone. So. And again, I walk people through all of that. I know it sounds complicated, but when I'm doing it, and that's why I don't really give people homework. That they, um, go to this website and do this. I'll give you homework for documents to collect for me because um, we share the screen and I walk you through each um, slide. That's why we're able to do, you know, um, SBA registration, everything within one session because I don't want to add to your burden. And um, Jesus is there as our manager. Our job is to facilitate you guys 
whether you're in business already or thinking about being in business one day. And of course, the AP certification, again, it's open to whether you're male, female, black, Asian, white, or Native American. Um, the government expectation, timely delivery, quality product, and reasonable price. And as I tell folks, and you have to be able to demonstrate, you cannot go to a government person and say, look, I know I can do this contract because I've been doing this in public for 30 years, and I know at the time delivery, no. It's good, but when you delivered it under corporate, you had a structure. Right now, not only do you have to show time, lead delivery, quality product, and reasonable price, you have to show business structure and business resources. Because if you're a one-man show and you're bidding for a contract that you know, even though you don't have to have your personnel in place, I'll disclaim that, um, to go after a contract, as long as if you get awarded this contract, you have the resources to mobilize everybody prior to the start of that contract. So saying that, you have to have resources, and I tell my people, have resources for at least three or four months. I have seen small contracts, small purchase orders, especially if you're a first timer with that government agency, it's, it's taking up to 90 days to get the payment flowing. And once it starts flowing, the government has this caveat, your, your um, invoice has to be, you know, um, almost imperfect. Um, I forgot the terms that they use because it's been years and I have to, um, you know, um, authorize invoices. But your invoice has to be giving where all line item match everything. There's no mistake. You don't have a comma instead of a period. You don't have a period instead of a comma. Your total is correct. Boom. That's um, a precise invoice. Once you're in the system, then that can go to the 30 days. And thank God now, most of the, um, you can also look for the um, payment terms that some government, um, I know some local contract with Miami Dade County, which Jackson mirrors Miami Dade County procurement process, by the way. Um, you know, they have the 15 day small business payment term. So that all also helps. I see the chat is going good, so I'm going to go fast. Again, contractors who are responsive, responsible, and reasonable. These are the three R's that the government looks for after you spend two or three months in all the little resources you have preparing an RFP. At the end of the day, that's what you're based on. So as I said before, um, you know, you get registered on Sundays. I got to add, Dundon Bradstreet now is, mm, because guess what? Um, Sam is going under a new system with the, um, what, what is it again, he says, the unique identification uh, number, um, some, the Sam, um, the Sam platform, um, platform now. The, um, I need to update my slide, but any anyway, of the IRS is a must, and I'm gonna add. Um, I may not take Don's ad, but I'm gonna add definitely the local business tax receipt because that's definitely um, a need. And you're done in actually number, and of course you're Sam, um, because we're talking federal here. Um, these are like the 24 agencies that are, you know, subject to mostly audits and um, where they have small business um, programs. And I believe um, a, a, a business office, office of um, something, I, I had to look it up, where they are dedicated only to small businesses. They are dedicated only, um, you know, they have training, they have, if you don't know something, thank God, you know, you have us here as a resource. And, you know, what we don't know, like I'm one of over 30 consultants on the overall um, umbrella program because um, SBA Navigator is one on the, the F, um, FIU, F, um, you know, FBDC program. So, you know, if we don't know it, we tap onto one of our folks that would um, that can help with that. So these folks are obligated to um, 
you know, contract art to small businesses, veteran, women owned, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and what I, one advice that I usually give is look at this list. Either you go on their website and see what they procure because everything is there. You know, you can even put a um, Nix code in and that's going to come up, um, you know, what they're purchasing. And decide out of the 24, what are your targets? Because you can't go after 24 agencies and be efficient. Start with two or three. And then and when you get successful, when you feel your strength, look at the other one. And I always tell people, start with the lowest hanging fruit. Start with the agencies that have an interest in your product, that have an interest in your services. You know, um, and that always helps. Yeah. There's a federal government website um, that I can send to his source that he can um, populate to everybody that literally um, give you a video that teaches you how you can see the government spent by year. And I believe 2021 has been put up. But each agency spent, and you can look it up through your service code, you can look it up through your commodity, you can look it up through whatever, and it tells you the corporate um, 500 companies that have um, win contracts and the size of the contracts. So where these companies understand that when the scope is so big and they just don't want to break it down, they'll give it to these big companies. But what the government does, there's something called flow down clauses. So the government is flowing down the clauses from their main contract to this contract, subprime contract, that has to flow it down to the sub. So if that particular project requires 25% of minority firms, depending on what socioeconomic group that project is designated for, that prime contractor is responsible to fulfill that. So they're crazy. That's why a lot of times you'll get email out of the blue if you're registered in the right platforms that tells you, you know, we're bidding this, or you're interested in this, or you're interested to bid this. You know, you get overwhelmed sometimes, you know, for the stuff that you receive. So with that, Jesus, I think that's the end of my presentation. I'm open for questions. Should I? Okay. All right. Thank you, Martha. Um, so yeah, so now we'll just open up for any questions and answers that you may have. Uh, please put it in the Q&A. And also I want to uh, thank uh, Howard Sr. Uh, from um, Congresswoman Salazar's office. Uh, we have done a lot of uh, workshops with them and also my colleague uh, Amaldi uh, Henao as well. So I, there's a lot of familiar faces, a lot of in the, in the industry, government contracting, well-versed and uh, like I said, it's about the connections and how we can all assist each other in the business needs and growth as well. Um, Martha, I have a question for you. Yes. Um, I would like to know where we can find the past performance awarded contracts so we can do a price competitive, you know, um, price analysis per se um, for the federal, state and local contracts. Usually the agency would, um, you know, well, they're supposed to post them and I have heard complaints that they have not. The key is having knowing what your contract number is, is, um, you know, contract number, the contract name is helpful. Because when you can request it, go in and find out who the contact person is in that procurement office. It is not posted because um, the government side should post upcoming opportunities you know, what's been awarded, contracts that are on award, what, what is being advertised right now in past award. If you don't find that and um, you have the name of that person for this new contract that you're look, um, trying to bid on, you um, but it's always helpful to know the 
contract number of that past contract because as a past government official, when somebody calls you and says, oh, you know what? Um, five years ago, you had a world, um, contract out on water sewer where you were digging Douglas Road. Um, okay. You know, so that doesn't help. Um, again, you know, make contact. And if you're even interested in bidding for that contract, I'm hoping that you have built some kind of relationships with the people prior to where they can talk to you, except if you send them an email. I hope that helps. Yeah. Then uh, is it possible to get contracts for a new business? I started if I haven't made much profit yet. Um, profit, again, you need resources. It could be where um, you get a small purchase for $20,000. You have, and then you accept, you get excited, thinking, oh my God, I can buy this for, you know, maybe 10, 12,000 and get, you know, um, 15, 20, 18,000 dollars for that. Just know that unless you have a relationship with a supplier that already where you can get these products and buy yourself a 30 day um you know window if you don't have the resources as a small business how are you gonna demonstrate to me that you can fulfill that work yep and then um i have a christopher smith here um christopher if you want to put your question in the q a i'll be able to moderate it for you okay um in the time being um yes this webinar is being recorded and also um, we'll be able to email you the presentation, also the link as well through our YouTube channel as well. Um, so right there, you're able to, to see it along with the other um, previous webinars that we have hosted, but at the same time, the future ones as well that, um, that we'll be having. Um, in addition, we are going to be having a vast amount of presentations, you know, webinars. Some are in person, some are gonna be online. Um, from all different topics. If there's a particular topic that is something of interest, just let me know um, and I'll be able to guide you as these are some that, that will be able to address and cater to those needs, okay? Uh, let me see, uh, what, and now Martha, what industries are more likely to be accepted as new businesses? There's no such thing. There's no such thing that there's a particular agency that accepts new businesses. Again, your business needs to be structured. Your business needs to, um, depending on what level you're trying to get into, that usually um, counsel to folks too. Not only are you gonna look for, you know, the government um, agencies that you wanna have some kind of um, relationship with. It takes two or three years, maybe to even bid your first contract to do that type of research. So in the meantime, I tell folks, let, um, if you're that small, but you're that good at your craft, have your um, competitors become your collaborators. What do I mean by that? Whatever industries you're in, I'm sure that there's like the, um, you know, Walgreens, the Walmart, the big muscle guys. Guess what, guys? These guys also, whether they have government dollars, federal dollars or not, which most of them do, they have small business programs because they love to showcase small businesses. They love, you know, to mentor. They love to, so again, you have to target you cannot go after everybody. When somebody asks me, what agency should I go um, to do business with? I'm like, it's your product. We're only meeting through Zoom where we're working on structure. If you don't know where to sell your product, it's hard for somebody to tell you. You know, once you define what your product and your services are, you have to define it. Some people are passionate about it and it's understood, but is it a viable business? Yeah, the government buys everything, 
at what rate, again, like I said, um, because I'm sharing my screen, I don't want to miss things up, but I can send the link yes, to his source. Send to me, send to me. It, you know, send it, you know I, I can send it now, but I'll send it after the um, thing where you, where you can go look and see which agency buys what. The business, um, the business owner has to um, really, oh, I don't know what to say. I mean, some people have full-time job and try to build a business. It, not that it's unreasonable, but it's just how much can you do? How much can you put forward? You know, so by having your competitors because that's like, so now you're building, you know, because you, you birthed this baby. This baby got to learn how to breathe on their own. They have to learn how to open their eyes or to open their hands. And finally, strong enough, they can sit up. It's literally, that's what a business is. And you got to make sure that you have structure because the government asks for profit or loss. So if you're a brand new business with nothing, what are you gonna provide? At least, you know, for a year. Now with certification, um, when they ask for business taxes, you know, they would accept your personal taxes because a lot of them just wanna see that you have five taxes with IRS mm -hmm. and you have not, um, you don't owe any taxes, but I'm so sorry, there's no magic formula. Because I always tell people, if there was one, I'd be using it. Yep. And then um, just to piggyback, um, will a small business be able to get a contract even if this was the business's first time? Again, depending on what contract, I, you know, I can tell you you could get a contract or not. Because big, um, I was giving an example yesterday. I worked for one of those big companies which were, had a dedicated um IFP, you know, um, proposal group. And that's what these guys do, right? With their own um, people that do the court, you know, everything. They would send out an average of 20 proposals a month. If we want two or three projects a quarter or every two quarters, they took the staff out. So that's what this world of government contracting is mm -hmm. so i'm not trying to discourage anyone but what i'm trying to say is start small you got to build capacity you cannot just um incorporate it last year and think you're gonna get your first government contract well are, are you registered do they know you exist do you have your local business tax receipt you know no, and, and at the same time, um, and also to chime in, like have a good capability statement as well. With uh, all the uh, a capability statement. As exactly. Well. Again, if you're so new, you don't have, any, you know, your capabilities there, you can transfer your corporate, you know, um, and that really only works mm -hmm. when the um, IFP asks for a qualified personnel and you happen to have those qualifications. Yeah. So what you can do as a class, we thought in some boot camp this week, where, um, you know, if you see a contract that has different quality, um, different requirements, and you know that line item number three is something that you can do, unless this RFP precludes you from um bidding on just that line item you can you know that's why it's so important that you have to get the possibility of what you want to bid on prior to it coming out i tell all my clients by the time it's advertised and has a due date it's too late for you yeah. and then um also starting a, a solutions okay starting a solutions business to government contracting the business plan and articles, articles of incorporation are complete. I am seeking guidance on the way ahead, the way ahead and steps. Is this within your area? I have been trying to get an appointment with two SBA offices so far, and I've been told to wait after 30 days. Um, I'm not really sure what yeah. the situation, um, but it's just you can sign him up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, 
yeah, just let, let's get to register. Um, yeah, um, Pilardo, just um, register and I'll be able to to triage it. Exactly, because once we um, Jesus does the assessment, he knows exactly where to send you. And again, we are all available. It's not as if you're assigned to a consultant A, you don't have access to A, B, C, D, and F. We're yeah. all available. Yeah, Pilaro, um, we'll, we'll be talking offline. I have your information. And um, we'll cross the T's, dot the I's. And I, um, and I do apologize for the 30-day for the 30, 30 wait. I want to make sure, I want to investigate more about that. So we'll talk yeah. offline. And then... Um, Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Uh, let me see. I think there's one more question, if I'm not mistaken. All right. Um, no, that's it. Uh, we have no more questions. But okay. like I said, um, we have um, you know, multiple workshops, webinars. Like I said, we're family. Anything that we could do to be of assistance, don't be shy. Follow us on our social media channels, give us a call, shoot us an email, and uh, we'll be more than happy to assist you and and uh, connect you with the appropriate connections, consultants, uh, spokes on the navigator program to to one close out 22 but at the same time have a good uh head start for 23 as well with those effective strategies so thank you again for attending today's webinar and i'll be looking forward to seeing you at the next webinar thank you thank have you a good everyone day. take care until we see you again bye-bye bye, -bye. bye, -bye.